Good morning and welcome to the University of Dubuque's 2018 Spring Commissioning Ceremony. Colonel Timothy Glynn, Lieutenant Colonel Michael Harris, President Jeffrey Bullock, Vice President Dr. Mark Ward, Peter Smith, Bob Brocious. Distinguished guests, cadets, family, and friends. The purpose of today's ceremony is to bestow upon eight young cadets their commissions as second lieutenants in the United States Army. As they accept their commissions, it will extend the number of lieutenants commissioned through the University of Dubuque's ROTC program to 125. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, please rise for the posting of the colors and remain standing for the playing of the national anthem. You may be seated. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Lieutenant Colonel Michael Harris, the professor of military science from the University of Northern Iowa and the University of Dubuque. <clears throat> thank you. Honored guests, family and friends of the ROTC program, I thank you for attending today's commissioning cer ceremony for these fine cadets and soon to be new lieutenants. I was fortunate to see these new lieutenants or new officers grow uh, from cadets to these new officers that are about to be um, over the past year. And today I thoroughly believe and they're committed their lives to lead the Army in protecting our freedoms and our way of life. The Army commissioning ceremony is a culmination of prospective officers successfully completion of education and training that prepares them to be leaders and soldiers. Commissioning ceremonies mark an important and singular moment in their army as it passes the mantle of trust and leadership to a new army officer. It is a solemn and time-honored tradition that celebrates a new officer's embarking on a journey of selfless service to our nation. And in doing so, the new officers make a commitment of, to defending the Constitution of the United States and the fundamental legal document that defines our democracy and some, symbolically represents every American citizen. The most significant part of the ceremony is the commissioning oath, which these cadets are about to take, which is linked to the set of ideals that have comprised the Army, its people, values, and service to the nation. The oath is simple and a deliberately, deliberately unconditional pledge of loyalty not to any individual or political party, but to the Constitution of the United States. Today, these cadets will take that oath, that oath few Americans take, Less than one half of 1% of our nation chooses to serve in the military. Today, they have achieved this goal of 
as they are about to become commissioned in the United States Army and graduate on Saturday. And it is an amazing accomplishment that they and their families should be proud of. These cadets have proven their ability to do well in a rapidly changing world where their adaptive thinking and mental agility demonstrate their capability to lead, operate, and succeed in moments of challenging and difficulty, challenge and difficulty. These cadets have endured many hours of academic study, physical training, field training in austere conditions, including overnight and snow and freezing weather, as well as hot and humid conditions, all while being placed in challenging leadership positions. In every turn in the journey, they have met the challenge head on and succeeded. I'm confident in these cadets to, and they are prepared to, to make the most difficult of decisions in the most austere environments. When you look back on our history in the most difficult of situations and chaotic disasters, they're leading, performing numerous acts of selfless service, sacrifice. Who is there giving hope to freedom? Our men and women of the military. And these cadets will be those men and women, and I have hope because I've seen their leadership skills and abilities over the past year. On a final note, the United States Army exists for one reason, to be the guardians of freedom, defending the American way of life. Our forefathers established our country generations before. They have kept our country free. They have sweat, bled, and many died in corners of the world. They have completed their mission at no, no matter the cost, and they have served something bigger than themselves. This is your legacy. It is up to you to carry it on honorably. The Army will continue to answer the call and fight of the win the world's win the nation's wars whenever and wherever it may occur. And when the Army is called upon, I know the Army is in good hands, because I have seen what these cadets and soon-to-be lieutenants can do. So good luck to you and to your careers, and Godspeed. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to now introduce our guest speaker, Lieutenant Colonel Timothy Glenn. Colonel Timothy Glenn is a distinguished military graduate of the University of South Dakota ROTC Department, where he accepted a regular Army commission as a military intelligence officer in the U.S. Army in 1989. He served as a platoon leader and assistant counterintelligence officer for 5th Signal Command, Worms, Germany, during operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm. In 1993, Glenn returned to South Dakota as a traditional guardsman commanding Bravo Company 2 133rd Infantry and Alpha Troop 1 113th Cavalry. In 2004, Glenn became an active guard soldier where he has served in an array of positions to include the 67th Troop Command S3, the 2nd Brigade S2, S3, and XO. Glenn's senior commands include the Counter Drug Task Force, 71st Civil Support Team, Brigade Special Troops Battalion, and the 671st Troop Command. Glenn deployed to Afghanistan in 2010, serving as the embedded training team commander responsible for mentoring Afghan National Police of the Panjshir Province. Presently, Glenn is in the Iowa Na Army National Guard G-1st Director of Personnel, transitioning to the Chief of Staff in June. Colonel Glenn has an MBA and a Master's of Strategic Studies from the Army War College. He is blessed with the support of Kathleen, his wife of 28 years, his daughter Elizabeth, a pharmacist at Mercy Hospital in Cedar Rapids, and his son, Cadet Stephen Glenn, Bravo Troop 113th Cavalry. Good job. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, cadets. I'm sorry, but this is what you're going to look like 30 years from now. <laughs> then again, I, I see some parents uh, in, in the room uh, that have service. And uh, obviously, you look more like them than you do me. But um, th there's good news and bad news to having myself as your speaker. The, the good news is, is uh, you're going to hear some, some stories. The bad news is, is I, I tend to run amok, so I'll, I'll try and keep it short to the point. For the rest of the audience, I apologize. I'm primarily going to be looking over here uh, because that's who I'm here for today. So if you did the quick calculations, 29 years, you know, what, what's going to happen between now and you commission 
and 29 years from now. Some of you, I can see, have already been in for a little while. You've had a couple of experiences. Uh, some of you have not. Some of you have already gone through uh, German Armed Forces proficiency testing and uh, air assault and airborne school. Hua. I'm not one of those badge people. I, I didn't pursue that route. I was regular Army military intelligence in 1989. And let me quickly reflect how much the world has changed in that 29 years. And interestingly enough, when you get like Colonel Harris and I and you come back after that time and you look back on the experience you've had, you'll value the day, the day today when you commission. But let me give you some reflections and understanding how the world can change in what to me seems like a short period of time of 29 years. I'm sorry, that was kind of funny, but this is a tough crowd. <laughs> okay. When I first commissioned as a second lieutenant, I was supposed to go to the 9th Infantry Division, 548th Ranger Battalion, and I was in pre-ranger school at the military, military intelligence basic course, Fort Huachuca, Arizona. I was lucky enough to graduate top of my class and was all hua and ready to go. Two mile run in 1136, 108 push-ups, 110 set-ups. You know what I'm talking about, right? Okay. You got to compete to get to get somewhere, right? Uh, two days before I graduated, uh, the chaplain was in the room. My company commander called me in and said, we're really excited to have you here, Lieutenant Glenn. I said, well, I'm leaving, sir, in two days. Yeah, well, that's what we need to talk to you about. Things have changed. The 9th Infantry Division is no longer. They're rolling up the flag. The Army's going a different direction. Okay, what does that mean to me, sir? You're going to be going to a place called Worms, Germany. Okay, what does that mean? You're going to be going overseas. Are you married yet? Uh, we're going to get married in 30 days, sir. Well, good. Might want to move that up a little bit so you can take her along. Okay. Wow, that was a change. Regular Army. One of the best things that ever happened to me. I don't know if I'd have ever volunteered to go overseas right away. But the great thing about what the Army did for me is it put me in a situation that I wasn't anticipating in a complicated, diverse environment I would have never, never anticipated. As a result, I got to be a brand new second lieutenant when the wall came down. Now, I don't know if any of you are historians, but you may not know what the wall is. <laughs> do they, Sergeant Reed? They don't know what the wall is, do they? No. Uh, the wall, uh, after World War II, uh, was assembled between parts of Germany, East and West Germany, and it was a symbolic uh, gesture on behalf of the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union, again, another historical perspective that the parents fully understand what I'm saying, but you may not have heard of. And, uh, and the NATO countries are what we call the West, okay? Little did I know uh, that was years in the making, and even to this day, um, it was a monumental occasion in history in Europe, and I got to be there. As a military intelligence officer, I was in charge with debriefing former East German soldiers in what's called the Golden Brooker program, Golden, Golden Bridge. And if former spies in the East Germany would turn themselves in, then they wouldn't be as heavily prosecuted, and I got to debrief them. Mind you, I was 23 years old. I was from South Dakota. I had had all of six months of training, and look what I was doing already. Okay. Why in the world would some National Guard colonel ask that we read this long bio? There's a reason. You too will have a diversity of assignments. When you're done with your commissioning today, take a moment to go around to all the former service members that you see here, either in uniform, with their legion caps, or you may even have to look for them. But you'll notice who they are, because they're gonna lock eyes with you and they'll know that either you've had or you will have similar experiences. And that's an identity that's a link that will live with you forever. So, some of the diversity of experience. Only four years of active duty. At the time, the uh, 
army was drawing down. In Germany alone, there were 300,000 soldiers. They wanted to get down to 90, a lot less now, a long time ago. No kidding, Sergeant Reed, there are that many people over there. Yeah, wow, they were everywhere. American soldiers, Canadian soldiers, British soldiers, all over Europe, okay? There's something else that was really exciting then. It was called email, and our commanding officer said, every day you need to go on and check your email and reply to all the emails. As if. I mean, what a pain to have to log in to some box that was green, the ugliest thing you've ever seen. And my, my sergeant said, sir, it's good. You need to do this every day. People will send you messages. This is never going to last. <laughs> no way. No one's going to do this every day. Interestingly enough, I'm getting 25 emails just on my drive up here today from, 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 from Des Moines, of which, I, of course, I totally ignore because I'm driving. But even now, you know, you can't escape email. But, but, but at the time, believe it or not, that was new. Okay, what other experiences might you encounter? Wars. Uh, wars are a terrible thing. But someone has to step forward. And you might hear this statistic of only 1% of our population step forward. But it's true. It's still true today. And you, possibly a long line of relatives within your family, are the next to that group to do so. Now, throughout those experiences with the wars, you may go to Iraq, you may go to Afghanistan, you may go to places that your mom and dad have never heard of and places you would have never imagined coming from Iowa, Minnesota, Illinois, right here in Dubuque, that people like us just don't normally go. And you're going to make friends, maybe a few enemies, and you're going to come back and it's going to make you a different person. I'm guaranteeing you, you'll be a better person. But as you go through those experiences, what you've learned here at the university, what you've learned in your hometowns, what you've learned from your relatives, are going to carry you through those experiences. Colonel Rajab in Afghanistan wasn't a whole lot different than Uncle Laddie, Laddie Murkwan, old Czech farmer from rural Yankton, South Dakota. As I worked with Colonel Rajab, we developed a trust. I'm not sure exactly how. I think it was maybe mutual respect. And in the province in Afghanistan, we actually brought electricity. And I kid you not, we brought electricity to the valley through microhydro plants. We built a couple bridges. We paved one road. And they thought we were wonderful just because we were willing to do that. And then we brought them something called a, a fire truck and a tow truck. And, and police vehicles. Now, I want to say cars, but they were actually Ford Ranger pickups, but they didn't have any of these things. And then we helped them develop emergency response plans in case there were emergencies in their valley so they could help the civilians and take care of the population. And as we developed those plans, the first thing I did is I said, what's an emergency in the Panjshir Valley of Afghanistan? And they said, snow, because snow can bring avalanches. I said, okay, how much snow? How much snow does it take to be an emergency in Panjshir, Afghanistan? Guess how much snow it takes? A meter. So I looked at my interpreter and I said, a meter? Now, maybe there's something lost in translation because a meter is 39 inches or so. Let, let's try it again. How much snow does it take to be an emergency in Panjshir, Afghanistan? A meter. Have you ever tried to walk in a meter of snow? No, I haven't. Uh-uh. I guess I haven't. That would be tough. But when does it get difficult for cars to drive through the valley? And they looked at me again and said, Colonel Glenn, how many roads do you see in this valley? One. How many paths do you see in this valley? Everywhere. So, lesson learned, maybe not in Iowa or South Dakota, but in Panjshir, Afghanistan, a meter of snow is an emergency. Here's the great thing about what we did. We developed a plan of how to get resources, blankets, food, 
water to people in case of a avalanche, because this is a valley that has one road. If you remember, I said we paved one road. 2015, guess what happened? Panchir got a meter of snow, and the avalanches came. Now, here's a lesson you're going to find. You're going to meet and work with people all over the world. You're going to bring home all those experiences. And you may not know exactly if it, if it benefited them or not, but I've got faith. I've got faith because we actually handed over our province back to the Afghans when we left. That province no longer has U.S. military presence other than visits. And what do you know one day when I'm Googling, trying to find pictures from, from Afghanistan? I see the tow truck, I see payloaders, and I see MREs and blankets being given to those people in Panjshir during the avalanche. Hoo-ah. Maybe I made a difference. The kid from Yankton, the kid from Iowa, maybe I made a difference. So, 29 years from now, when you get to go to the University of Dubuque, the University of South Dakota, the University of Iowa, wherever it leads you, and you look back 29 years from now, who knows, maybe you'll remember Colonel Glenn's story about the fact that email's never going to last, and how the world can change with something called the wall or the Soviet Union. Those are things that have changed just in my career, and I'm getting towards the end. My gosh, what's going to change in the course of your career? And I look at the diversity of your branches. I see infantry. I see engineers. I see medical. I see chemical, ordnance, supply. You're almost like a dream team of officers that we plucked out of the good old Midwest. So when you go over to wherever it is you are at, remember this day. Remember this day. Remember your mom and dad. Remember your relatives that are here. Remember the other veterans that you run into today. And share your stories just like they're going to share their stories with you. I wish you the best. Gosh, I'm really proud to be here. And believe it or not, a shiver just went up my spine. Someday at 2 in the morning, you're going to wonder why you did this. But the close of the following day, when the mission's complete, you'll know why you did it. And you'll be proud, your parents will be proud, your grandparents and your uncles, your aunts will all be proud of you. So on behalf of Major General, General Tim Moore, the Adjutant General of Iowa, thanks for letting me come here today and address you. And I wish you the best in your coming career. Thank you. Colonel Glenn, thank you for your keen insight. As a token of our appreciation, Cadet James would like to present you with a gift, which is a challenge coin from the University of Dubuque Veterans Center for being our guest speaker and for your support of the UD ROTC program. Ladies and gentlemen, family and friends, these cadets have put in countless hours of training and preparation for this eventful day. Please feel free to come forward and take pictures as you wish as we indoctrinate these commissionees into the Army. Would the commissionees please rise and come forward to take your oath of office?
Congratulations, lieutenants. You may return to your seats. Lieutenant Colonel Harris, would you like to say your part? Oh, yeah. Okay, Colonel Glenn uh, and President uh, Jeffrey Bullock, would you please come forward? Would you like to please join me in, at the podium present the commissioning certificates? I'd like to individually. Cadet Fames here will introduce individually each of the cadets uh, for the spring commissioning class in conjunction with traditional painting of the bars. And at this time, the new second lieutenants will also receive their commissioning documents and exit through the traditional saber arch, which is over here. After passing through the arch, they'll receive their first hand salute from a non-commissioned officer who has made the most significant impact uh, on him or her during the ROTC training. They will present the non-commissioned officer with a silver dollar. Jordan Hamling, hometown Forsyth, Missouri, majoring in criminal justice with a minor in military science, branching transportation active duty, pinning on rank mother Lynn Hamling and father Scott Hamling, giving lieutenant his first salute, family friend Sergeant Tommy Breedlove. Jonathan James, hometown Des Moines, Iowa, majoring in wellness and exercise science with a minor in military science, branching medical services active duty, pinning on his bars, wife Shawnee James and parents Fred and Rose James, giving lieutenant his first salute, grandfather, private first class, Dwight James. Jacob Johnston, hometown Marengo, Illinois, majoring in human health science with a minor in military science, branching engineer active duty, pinning on his bars parents Bindi and Dan Johnston, giving the lieutenant his first salute, Staff Sergeant Rick Nordmeyer, Air Force. Grace Kovarik, hometown Downers Grove, Illinois, majoring in biology with a minor in military science, branching chemical with the Illinois National Guard, pinning on her bars, mother Dina Kovarik and father Matt Kovarik, giving lieutenant her first salute, Sergeant First Class Joshua Dykes.
Raymoy Lewis, hometown St. Thomas, Virgin Islands, majoring in wellness and exercise science with minor in military science, branching medical services, active duty, pinning on bars, mother Rosalind Smith and sister to Jada Smith, giving Lieutenant his first salute, father, Sergeant First Class, Leroy Smith. Anthony Reed, hometown Dubuque, Iowa, majoring in aviation management with a minor in business and military science, branching infantry active duty, pinning on bars, mother Nancy Reed and brother Andrew Reed, giving lieutenant his first salute, father retired BU-1 SCW Thomas Reed. Daquan Reed, hometown Fayetteville, North Carolina, majoring in criminal justice, minoring in communications and business military science. Branching engineer active duty, pinning on bars, mother Tamika Reed and sister Janiska Reed, giving lieutenant his first salute, father retired Sergeant First Class Kareen Reed. Adam Wright, hometown Lena, Illinois, majoring in criminal justice, minor in military science, branching ordinance with the Iowa National Guard, pinning on bars, mother Joyce Wright and father Robert Wright, giving lieutenant his first salute, grandfather retired Corporal Larry Torin.
Ladies and gentlemen, would you please stand for the benediction and the playing of the army song? Before I give the benediction, I would take a moment and invite you to pray uh, for these wonderful folks being commissioned today. Let's pray. Almighty and ever-loving God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer, every good gift comes ultimately from your hand. You are the source of all wisdom and understanding. We are so very thankful for all that you teach us each and every day. We are especially thankful for all that you have taught these men and women in their time of learning, the laughter, the camaraderie, the testing of their abilities, these are gifts for which we are so very thankful. Today we want to pause in our headlong rush of life and give you thanks for this time to come together and honor and congratulate those who are being commissioned, to celebrate with those who have supported them. As we give recognition to some very deserving individuals, we ask for a special touch of your blessings on them today and help them to have a strong sense of a job well done. May your spirit of remembrance rest on them so this pinnacle moment may return to them in times of stress and hardship. While graduating and being commissioned, their time of gaining wisdom is just beginning. Help them to grow strong in wisdom in order to weather life's storms. Those whom you have called your people have prayed to you as their deliverer and defender, and I make that claim for all of us this day, but especially those being commissioned. Defend and protect them, I pray even as they serve to defend and protect others. Give them strength to be men and, and women of integrity and so guard their hearts that they would increase in compassion so that their leadership is both capable and redemptive wherever they are called to serve. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I pray, amen. And now, friends, I invite you and I charge you, all those gathered here this morning, to continue to remember, to support, to pray for those being commissioned. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and every day. Amen. On behalf of the University of Dubuque ROTC program, thank you for your continued support and commitment in making this moment possible for these young men and women. This concludes today's ceremony. Please feel free to take as much time as you need for photos.